teach and still have fun, okay? I think you can be a student and still have fun. I know maybe most of your classes you don't feel that way, but you should. You should enjoy yourself while you're here. Well, welcome back to our last day and sessions uh, 13 to 15 of our uh, looking together at the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. For those who are joining us by live stream, sorry we were dealing with some in-house uh, uh, assignment issues that are very important for the men that are taking the, uh, the class for credit. And uh, so since it didn't involve you, we just uh, waited a few minutes before we got to the actual presentation again of the biblical material. But we're glad to, to have you again tune in, and uh, we're going to pick it up in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 13, uh, into the second day of the seventh month of uh, this uh, great time of communication of God's word to God's people and uh, their response in the year 444 B.C. As we begin this uh, final day together, once again, let's invoke the Lord's blessing upon our time in prayer. Let's pray. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the days you've given to us together, uh, days that we can uh, come and uh, hear your word read, your word taught. Uh, we can discuss, we can interact on, on the, the biblical text. In many ways, uh, enjoying the same quality of time that we are seeing described in chapters 8, 9, and 10 of Nehemiah. Uh, that uh, time when your people came together from early in the morning until midday, uh, in many ways like we have come together from the morning to noon uh, to, to devote ourselves to the hearing of your word. And uh, Father, I pray that by your spirit you might use your word in our lives as you used it almost 2,500 years ago in the life of post-exilic Israel in Jerusalem. Uh, Father, we, uh, we thank you that the same Holy Spirit that uh, gave us scripture is the same Holy Spirit that guides us in the understanding of that scripture. Uh, Father, as your people were on record as uh, hearing your word and understanding and then obeying it, doing it, that your people reflect the very uh, response of uh, Ezra who set his heart, that made it his priority to, to gain the meaning of your word and practice of his own life before he taught it. Uh, Father, we thank you that even the people he taught also came to understand so that they might apply the truth directly to their lives. Father, that's what we want in our lives as well and in our ministries as we communicate your word to others. Uh, Father, we want to be good stewards of Scripture good stewards who come to the text that you've entrusted to us, that we might study it, we might learn it, we might gain an understanding of it, that it might transform our lives first, and then as we communicate it, be taken by your Spirit to give understanding and transform the lives of those who hear it through our ministry. May that be true today as it was in Ezra and Nehemiah's day, may it be true of these men as they will only go forth from this place to the four corners of the earth uh, to, to teach your word, to exposit it, to communicate it, to make your truth known. Uh, Father, may we see this, this process that we are speaking about in Scripture reduplicated in our lives and in our ministries many times over. And Father, we pray that through all of this, it might be your name that receives the honor and the glory as we pray this through the strong name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 
All right, back to this, uh, this high point of the book. And as we said yesterday, uh, a high point as far as Old Testament history is concerned. I'll uh, repeat what I said yesterday, that other than the second generation of Israel hearing Moses for 30 days on the plains of Moab exposit, the uh, truth that have been given in Torah culminating in the speeches that are recorded in what we now call Deuteronomy that, uh, that exposit God's revelation, God's information, God's teaching, instruction that uh, he gave in the totality of Torah and, uh, and, and devoted themselves to hearing that word and appropriating that word, understanding it, applying it to their lives as they were to go in to the land of Canaan. That uh, the only other place we see that reduplicated, you know, for all of Israel. And certainly this is not all Israel because all Israel is not, not back in the land in 444 B.C. That the vast majority of Israel is still, is still living outside of Yehud in other parts of the Persian Empire and even outside of the reach, some of them in the southern part of, of Egypt. So God's, you know, the Jewish people are not all in Jerusalem, but those that were in Yehud who, who gathered as one man. And so we might put it this way, the, the unity of the remnant was likened to, the, uh, to the, uh, the assembly of Israel on the plains of Moab, hearing God's servant, God's expositor, God's teacher of his word, of his instruction, of his Torah, uh, giving that to them, reading it, giving the sense, giving the understanding that they might uh, respond appropriately and obediently in the same way a second generation of Israel uh, did, book of Deuteronomy, uh, same thing here in Nehemiah 8 through 10. And, uh, and uh, you, you might have uh, preached uh, Deuteronomy because that obviously is a major portion of God's uh, word. It's, uh, it's a part of scripture that uh, impacted the rest of scripture. The Deuteronomic speeches uh, continue to echo forth in both Old and New Testament. And of course, the problem is that Nehemiah 8 through 10, uh, the, the following biblical record does not echo it in the same way as Moses' Torah. That, uh, that when Jesus Christ came, uh, the, the religious leaders didn't, uh, uh, didn't compare him to Ezra, they compared him to Moses. He was a greater than Moses, but of course, he's also a greater than Ezra as well, but that's, that, that's not, you know, the, uh, the discussion because this portion of God's word didn't have the same kind of ramifications and echoing, uh, even, uh, even among the, uh, the, uh, the Jewish leaders at the time of Christ, as did the words of Moses. But I think as we're going through them, they're no less potent and no less important, and gentlemen, you can preach three chapters of Nehemiah much quicker than 34 chapters of Deuteronomy. So um, uh, this is a, a good place to even bring God's people today to, to think in terms of what it means to, to hear, understand, and respond appropriately to God's word. That's, that's what we're seeing in these chapters. We saw at the end yesterday as we saw what happened on the first day, recorded in the first 12 verses of Nehemiah chapter 8. Now Ezra is fulfilling the dictate that our Xerxes gave to him to teach the people the law, God's law, God's instruction. And uh, he did so on the first day. And we pick it up in verse 13 to 18. Now this is going to go all the way from the second day through the 22nd day of the seventh month because uh, we are seeing the, the foundation for and then the, and then the response to God's word for God's people on the uh, Feast of 
tabernacles. And we say here they respond obediently to the command of God. In fact, they, they obeyed, as it were, to the letter. And as we come to these, uh, these verses, there's a very definite uh, chiasm that is taking place here. Verses 13 to 15, uh, we see the, the preparation, we see the foundation. And in verses 16 to 18, we then see the, the resulting observa- uh, the observing observation of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so when we, when we see that echoing, verses 13 to 15, then echoed in verses 16 to 18, the foundation laid, and then the result in the, the life of the people, as uh, Goswell brings up, that, uh, that, that hinge at the end of verse 15 is vital. This is the hinge of the chiasm. As it is written. I can put it this way, verses 13 to 15 is the learning of what is written. Verses 16 to 18 is the application, the obedient application of what is written. So, don't just do an exposition of, uh, you know, the first 12 verses. Do a secondary uh, uh, exposition. Continue on, verses 13 to 18, because this is also, again, we see the impact of Scripture upon God's people. Well, verses 13 to 15 are the leaders. Verses 16 to 18 are the people. So you can note in verse 13, the the subject is the heads of the father's households of all the people, the priests, and the Levites. In verse 16, so the people went. So we're, we're seeing... In verses 13 to 15, the response of the leaders to what has taken place, they learn what is written, communicate it to the people, and the people respond appropriately and accordingly. So verse 13 is key, and particularly the people here, the the heads of the father's household, and the priests, and the Levites, because these three groups of leaders as you go back into the Old Testament were uniquely called to be communicators of God's Word. We saw a couple of days ago in Ezra chapter 7, Ezra being a priest, Leviticus chapter 10, that the priests were to teach the people clearly God's revelation so they might be able to make the distinction between what is holy and, uh, and profane, what is clean and unclean, so they might uh, come and act appropriately and accordingly before the Lord and uh, not come into His uh, presence inappropriately, had did uh, Aaron's sons Nabat, uh, Nabat and Abihu in uh, Leviticus chapter 10. So the priest's responsibility, I mean, in other words, if the people don't know what God has said, that's first and foremost the priest's responsibility. And that's why Ezra, as a priest, is raised up in uh, this day to be, that, uh, to be that teacher that we are reading about. But not only the priests, but also the Levites. The Levites were the helpers of the priests. They were to help the priests in their priestly ministry. That They, too, as helpers of the priests, there were certain of the Levites who also would uh, be set apart not only just to lead uh, God's people in worship, but also to help the priests in that, in that instruction of the people in God's Word. We've already seen uh, on the first day of the month how Levites helped Ezra as he was reading, give, get, translating and giving the sense so the people could understand what was being read. So the Levites... At least certain Levites had a very important role to play in that as well. And the heads of the father's uh, households. That the leader of the clan, the, 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 if we might put it this way, the patriarch of, of the extended family, the man, also had a responsibility 
to instruct his extended family in the things of the Lord. That's basically a Deuteronomy chapter 6. The father uh, is, uh, when he stands, when he sits in his daily activities, he is to be communicating the, uh, the reality of Israel's God and communicating the truth from Scripture of God to his family. So these, these three elements, it's interesting who comes first. It's the heads of the father's households of all the people. That, that many times that is, and was in Israel, a missing link. And it certainly was up until this point, as we've already seen, Ezra was in Jerusalem for, you know, 14 years before the events recorded here, you know, ultimately take place. The teacher was there, and certainly during that time he was also training Levites. The, the failure came with the heads, the elders of the father's households, were also to be involved in leading God's people, and we might put it this way, were the, uh, were the leaders closest to the people, because these were the heads of the clans that made up the, the people of Israel. By the way, by application, I mean the New Testament, yeah, you can have apostles and prophets and pastor teachers, but ultimately it comes down to having elders in churches that are able to communicate God's truth. Uh, you can be a great pastor teacher, but you also need men of God and men, 1 Timothy 5, ne not necessarily who do it as, as the... Uh, vocational ministry, honor those, particularly the labor and the word, and, uh, and, and those who, who, who do it, that's their major responsibility. But all elders are to be able to teach. And of course, then even within our families, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, fathers are to bring up their children in the nurture and discipline of the Lord. So um, it's not just at the upper level. It's not just the seminary professors, you know, trained the past, the teachers sent out to the churches, you know, to communicate God's word on a, an, on a weekly basis. These set-apart men who do it, you know, full-time. Uh, so we have the Ezra's and, uh, you know, we have the, uh, the priests and uh, the Levites. But it also comes down to the fact that we've got to have elders. We've got to have these recognized spiritual leaders lay leaders, if we can use that term, as we see here in, in the Old Testament by analogy. Uh, same thing was true there as then, you know, by analogy comes, uh, continue to be reality as far as the New Testament church is concerned. All the way down to dad. Dad has to know the scripture. Well, we don't have all the dads of Israel necessarily here, but certainly those, those, those uh, that, that upper level and then with the heads of the father's households, were gathered to Ezra the scribe that they might gain insight into the word of the law, uh, the, the words of the law, the words of God's instruction. So seeing the response of the people means that the leaders of the people, priests, Levites, and the heads of the father's household, if the people are learning the word and appropriate, well, we better get ahead of them. We better learn the word too. By the way, there might be some of you that are involved in uh, in uh, churches where the uh, uh, you know the leadership, the, the pastor and elders might not be the most outstanding uh, students and expositors of God's word. Well, if you want to, if you really want to challenge them. Uh, become a good student yourself. And uh, they'll probably say, those are my people. I need to get in front of them. That's basically what's taking place here. Look, the people are understanding and appropriating God's word. And we're their leaders. All right? If they're getting that knowledge, of scripture, we better get ahead of them. We've got to be able to lead them. So don't discount the fact of how 
how you can have an impact being a good student of God's Word, even as a layperson, to challenge the, uh, the leadership that, uh, that God has called to be studious. And, uh, and by the way, that also comes, be very, very, very receptive. That uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 5, you know, I've, I have many things to say to you, but you are not able to receive them. You want your preacher to be a more in-depth expositor? Well, then be a good student of Scripture yourself, ready to receive what God has given to them. If you're not able to, they've got to, they got to back off. They've got to put the brakes on. And I can tell you this, in ministry, like any other area of life, once you start getting lazy, it's hard to crank it up again. So God's people do have an important role to play in what takes place in the communication of God's Word. It's not all just on the preacher. Well, I'm sorry, there we go, application again, but uh, implications for the present and the pertinent application. So in this historical moment, this, this enthusiasm about God's Word penetrates into the leadership. They gather to Ezra. They know who God's teacher is, Ezra the scribe. And notice in verse 14, they found written in the law. Now, Ezra might have directed them, but they are the ones who are learning. The they goes back to the heads priests and the Levites who were gathered to Ezra. This, this was not just, you know, being spoon-fed. They found written in the law how Yahweh the Lord had commanded through Moses the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seven months. And there's numbers of passages in the Old Testament, particularly with the instruction they're going to give in verse 15, they particularly focus upon the instruction in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, significantly, they begin the study on the second day of the month, and the 15th day of the month is when the Feast of Booze was to be held. How providential. They are hearing and responding to Leviticus 23 that goes over the great feast days in Israel, and they realize, well, they're right between, you know, uh, trumpets and David Toman on the 10th and the Feast of Booze on the 15th to the 21st with a culminating celebration on the 22nd day. And uh, so they, they, they find the actual instruction. And so, verse 15, they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem. Now, once again, remember, they don't, you know, within a day, the courier can be, you know, everywhere because Yehud is not that big. Three or four couriers could, you know, cover, cover, the, cover the whole province, uh, you know, basically in a day or two. So here's the proclamation. Very interesting, we had a proclamation in Ezra chapter 1, and we got another proclamation here in Nehemiah 8. And this proclamation comes from the leadership not just from Ezra, the leaders of the people, the heads of the father's households, and the priests and the Levites. And they proclaim to the, all the people, go out to the hills, bring olive branches, wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booze as it is written. And significantly, Leviticus 23 talks about, you know, going out and getting the, the, uh, the, the branches uh, doesn't spell all these out because all these were not available in the, the wilderness when Moses gave that legislation in Leviticus 23. But they understand when it talks about branches, what, what branches are available to us here? And so they make sure, you know, the olive and wild olive branches, the myrtle branches, palm branches, branches of other leafy trees. In other words, uh, they spell it out. Right. You talk about implication to, to application. Right. If, we're to, if we are to use the, the branches of trees, let's spell out what's available. And they do. 
to make booze as it is written. So verse 16, notice, the people went out and brought and made booze for themselves on each roof in their courts, in the courts of the house of God, in the square of the water gate, in the square of the gate of Ephraim. They did exactly what they were told to do. So the proclamation is made based upon what has been discovered in the Word of God, and the response of the people is to do exactly what they were told. In fact, verse 17, the entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booze and lived in them. Notice again, the entire assembly. And even, this is, even if it is a hyperbole, even if it was one or two who didn't, Nevertheless, it's hyperbole that, that has a great truth behind it, which is this was basically everybody. So whether the entire assembly meant every last one obeyed, it was certainly such that, uh, that this penetrated throughout, the, uh, throughout all of the people. And they made the booze and they lived in them. And then this little aside, the sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua. And it's interesting that uh, the Hebrew makes this Jeshua echoing back to the priest of uh, chapters 2 through 6, drawing a connection between Jeshua of the post-exilic community and Joshua, the, the great general and conqueror uh, during the conquest of Canaan. And certainly the son of Nun says we're not dealing with uh, the historic Joshua of three generations before this, but going all the way back a thousand years to Joshua, the son of Nun in that day. And of course the, uh, the question arises, well, in what way was this like what took place in Joshua's day, the conquest generation? By the way, notice there the link between the second generation of Israel that heard Moses' exposition on the plains of Moab, Deuteronomy, and this generation. Here's the, the exposition of Torah, of God's word through Ezra and the Levites. So... I have biblical warrant for the link I made between those two generations. And, and the response being that, uh, that really there had never been such a close appropriation of exactly what God said when it came to the keeping of the Feast of Booze since Joshua's day. Now, again, most uh, think that this is somewhat of overstatement to make a point. That, well, during the days of David, during the days of Josiah, you know, when there was uh, obedience to God's word, the days of Samuel, don't you think they went back and you know, aligned their celebrations as closely as possible to what the word of God had to say? And so, if though most, Exegetes would take this more as a figure of speech, take it figuratively, that what it's doing is emphasizing the, the extent of their obedience. Uh, maybe it is literal. Maybe this is the first time in a thousand years the biblical, the, the biblical uh, commandments concerning the Feast of Booze were, were followed to the letter by this generation in a way not seen in Israel since the days of the conquest under Joshua. And I have to admit, gentlemen, I, I am one of those who believes when the literal sense makes good sense, why seek a figurous sense? Uh, many times it's, it's 
it goes back to kings, that uh, there had never been a king more faithful since David and Hezekiah. There had never been a king more, more obedient to the Lord than Josiah since David. And well, that, what does that do for Hezekiah's obedience? What, is, what does that do for Josiah's faithfulness? Uh, aren't these just maybe figurative statements to emphasize the the, the, the the, the a great faithfulness, the great obedience um, that, uh, that was exhibited by these kings. So it's, it's based upon on, on that and saying, okay, this, this, this becomes a figurative uh, statement as far as Old Testament historical literature is concerned, being picked up here by the author of Ezra Nehemiah, who is uh, uh, like, the, like the prophet who uh, wrote Kings, uh, is is making that kind of a statement. But there is a sense in which, even with Hezekiah, Hezekiah had to exhibit great faith in 701 B.C., but certainly as you go through Kings and particularly the book of Isaiah, he was not completely obedient. And yes, Josiah was obedient, but uh, he made a foolish decision and got himself killed. So, I mean, how... Uh, how did he manifest, you know, faith, uh, you know, toward the Lord? Yeah, faithfulness in his obedience, but that doesn't mean he was, was, was faithful to the degree of Hezekiah. So that's just a little bit of my reservation of making this figurative instead of making it literal. And uh, I, I don't go to the stake for it. Um, I don't want to go against the majority that says this is probably a figurative statement rather than a literal statement. But if the literal sense makes sense, uh, you know, why make him do a figure of speech? And just as we saw in chapter 6, there was great rejoicing. And also, also chapter 3 with the laying of the foundation of the, uh, the temple and the dedication of the temple and the first Passover. When God's word is obeyed and when God's work is celebrated, there is joy. God's work is obeyed, when God's work is celebrated, there was great joy. And this should be to this day. Whenever we see God work, that should produce joy, a deep-seated emotional satisfaction that we are God's people and we have seen God at work and God has given us His Word and we see it working out in life and particularly in communal life, body life. There's great rejoicing. Now Ezra comes front and center, verse 18. He read from the book of the law of God daily, from the first day to the last day. They celebrated the feast seven days, and on the eighth day a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. So we saw it at the hinge of the, of, uh, the, the chiasm. Uh, we see it then in verse 18 in the concluding statement that exactly how God communicated the tabernacles was to be celebrated exactly the way it was done. It was all done according to the ordinance that is in Scripture. So they, they heard God's word, they understood God's word, and uh, they obey God's word to the letter. That's the thrust of this passage. And uh, it was under the direction of the God-ordained leaders who were to know God's Word and to obey God's Word and communicate God's Word. They were to follow the example of Ezra as other priests and Levites and heads of the father's households. They did so. They fulfilled their biblical responsibility. The response... Was, uh, was total obedience on the part of the people. And once again, gentlemen, if you want God's people to obey God's word, be an example of that in your own life first. Don't expect the people God has entrusted to you uh, to, uh, to go beyond your example. As we said yesterday, be like Paul. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And uh, you people 
should be able to see you as an imit you know, imitate you. And not just imitating Christ, but imitating your response to God's word. That you learn it. You practice it. And then as you teach it, they too learn it. And they too apply it and practice it as well. That's, uh, that's, that's the biblical example. That's br brought us to the 22nd day. Now, when it said that he read from the book of the law daily, from the first day to the last day, that would be seven straight days. We don't know how long that, uh, that would entail. It's very, very interesting. In Deuteronomy chapter 31, remember on the sabbatical year in the seventh month, the, the Levites were to read the Torah in all Israel's uh, hearing. So at, I would put it this way, that I think for seven days, and the, there's a debate, we don't know whether this was a sabbatical year or not, but I think, you know, given uh, that uh, directive in Deuteronomy chapter 31, uh, I believe that during the Feast of Tabernacles here, I think implicit based upon their total obedience to God's word, and again, we can't, we don't know if it was a sabbatical year, but under that, that ordinance, since they gathered together for the Feast of Booze, and, and, and the one commandment concerning the Word of God was to read Torah, Genesis 1, basically through Deuteronomy 34, that I would probably say they took enough time every day to make sure they got through. And you got seven days, and uh, uh, that that took place, and maybe three or four hours a day was enough to read it so they were able to, to, to get through the whole Torah. And that might be your first example of systematic, verse-by-verse, -verse, biblical exposition. On this Feast of Tabernacles, where they began at the beginning and went all the way and read it through to the end over seven days. And uh, I don't think hopscotched. They didn't hop from here to there. But well, they read from beginning to end. So it would seem implicit if they were hearing and, like I said, being obedient to the very letter of what was said in the, uh, the Torah. And uh, we'll never be able to conclude whether this was a sabbatical year or not. Actually, there's you know, debate on whether it was 445 or 444 B.C. You can take a look at the chronolo chron chronological notes. I take 444. As, uh, as the date. So if we, can't, if we can't pinpoint the exact year, it's kind of hard to say whether it was, even if we had a list of the sabbatical years, which we don't. Um, uh, now, we know God keeps them because Chronicles is going to end with the captivity with 70 years, so the land could have its Sabbaths. So God knew where the sabbatical years were. He knew whether they, whether they followed the sabbatical observation or not. So... It's kind, of, it's kind of like God knows, God knows every Jewish person, the tribe they're a part of today, even though they don't. And so we might not know exactly the year which made the sabbatical years, but God still knows. And, uh, and I certainly knew it in, uh, in uh, this time as well. So who knows? It didn't all correlate together, and that's the reason why Ezra read you know, from Torah every day during that, uh, that Feast of Tabernacles, echoing Deuteronomy. Chapter 31, verses 9 through 12. Well, that leads then to the 24th day. A question is always asked, why didn't the author talk about the Day of Atonement? Uh, we, we're not... We're not like what we talked about in Ezra chapter 3 where there's an altar but no temple. We have now have the temple. So we assume learning Leviticus chapter 23 and being so precise and following the letter as far as tabernacles, if they're that obedient, they did observe the, the Day of Atonement. I mean, you can't, you can't have them being this studious and knowledgeable, 
and obedient without it taking place. But the author has chosen not to include it in the record. And I believe there's a reason why. Because what happened on the 24th day was more extensive and more inclusive than what took place on the Day of Atonement. Remember on the Day of Atonement, the high priest, he is the one who confesses the sins of Israel as he has his hands on the head of the goat. Goats, one that will be slain and one that will be led away into the wilderness. The, the sins being, being dealt with penally and being borne away. That's the picture of the Day of Atonement. And, uh, and Israel saw the, the, the offering being accepted by God, the blood being sprinkled in the Holy of Holies by the high priest. God accepted the, the slain uh, animal as, as a substitution for what their sins deserved. And not only that, not only were they forgiven, but the second goat led away also shown that sin was not only forgiven, but completely borne away, never, you know, to come into their relationship with God again, never, never to be an issue in their relationship with God. So, so it, it is, it is a dealt with substitutionarily, and it is, you know, borne away. That's that's the picture of the Day of Atonement. But it's not here in the Nehemiah eight. Because the Day of Atonement was basically the priest acting on the, as representative on behalf of the people. What's going to happen in chapter 9 is the people themselves being led by the Levites to confess their sin. If I might put it this way, Nehemiah 9 takes the Day of Atonement a step further. David told is important because they saw the priest representing them and they accepted by faith what the priest did. And all right, I'll see a type there in Leviticus chapter 16. It's not here, but it's in, again, it's not here in Ezra and Nehemiah that the people see what the priest does on their behalf and accepts it by faith. You understand, we're the, all right, the greater high priest who has taken not the blood of an animal, but his own blood, okay, Hebrews 9 and 10, into the, in the sanctuary, had it accepted, and we accept that by faith. We accept the priest's ministry on our behalf by faith. That's what's taking place on the Day of Atonement. I'm not doing anything but watch as a sinner in Israel as opposed to what's going to happen here in 444 B.C., recorded in Nehemiah chapter 9, where now we're going to have the people led by the Levites verbally give confession of sin. This is not watching and accepting. This is repenting and involvement. Person involvement in what is taking place. They're going to vocalize. So what is watched on the Day of Atonement is vocalized on this 24th day. And this is not ordinance. This doesn't become a continuing ordinance within Israel like the Day of Atonement. This was just unique to that year as these scripture-saturated Israelites in Yehud. Remember, they, they got that conviction the very first day, trumpets. But, uh, they, were, they were mourning and weeping because of their sin. So it wasn't appropriate on the first day, it's appropriate on the 24th day. And that's what takes place. All right, a question? Oh, I was just trying to...
trying to say is that necessarily exclude the Day of Atonement being no. what was solving? No. No. Okay. No, I okay. I can't prove it. I just have to say the tenor of the passage showing how they're hearing and obeying Torah to the letter has to mean that they did uh, uh, they did have the, the Torah, of, uh, they did have the Day of Atonement observance. Now, that could not happen in Ezra 3 because there's no temple. All right? So we know why it's excluded in Ezra 3. Why we just go from the building of, you know, the first day they get together, they build the altar off of the, uh, you know, begin offering the burnt offerings, and then we, then we skip ahead to tabernacles. Okay, that, that has to be so historically because there's no temple you can't have. You know, you, you have no, you know, you, you have no uh, holy of holies. You have no whole, most holy place. Taking it a step further. Yeah, but, but taking it a step further. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've tried to give you what I think is the rationale for why it's not mentioned in Nehemiah chapter 8, but this day, the 24th day, is. Okay. It's not because it wasn't celebrated. It's because the... Well, and what flows out of the 24th day, not only with their confession, but then with their rene covenant renewal, uh, all of that is, is much more vital than just watching what the priest does for you. So, not, not negative, because that's the ordinance. Okay? The priest is representing me. Uh, so, that's, uh, that, that to me is the distinction historically between what's in Ezra 3 and Nehemiah 8, 9, is, uh, well, eight, because of uh, uh, Day of Atonement would come, uh, would come before the Feast of Booze is narrated at the end of chapter eight. So but that's, the, that's the difference. The temple was there, and so we assume their obedience. They obeyed. Why is that not in the text? Now, you could give a simple answer. It wasn't, it wasn't in the material the author was using. But still, again, you got the Holy Spirit behind this. Why did the Holy Spirit choose not to, to show their obedience to uh, the Day of Atonement, but then spend two chapters dealing on what happened on the 24th day? And there's no ordinance about the 24th day. This, this is... This is appropriating God's Word and saying, we, we have been rebuked, we understand our sin, we understand how our sin has a heritage of sin in our fathers, and we need to come together in humility, and we need to confess that sin, and on the basis of that confession, we need to act and say, we're going to be different going forward, we're going to be, we are going to be obedient to the letter of the law that God has given to us in Moses, uh, through yeah. Moses. That's what's taking place in 9 and 10, which I say is, is more personal and, uh, and more inclusive than what, take, what takes place on the Day of Atonement. Day of Atonement, I just watch. There's no, there's my, my involvement just to believe what's being done on my behalf. Now, I don't want to discount that because, I mean, that's saving faith. But saving faith then has to, all right, not that that was done for me, but I have to personally confess. I mean, there's, a, there's another step. And, and these are so convicted from, they, this generation is so convicted from Scripture, they have to take that second step that wasn't commanded, you know, per se, by ordinance. But they do so. And there is no ordinance. And, of course, we have no record that Israel ever did this again. This, this was a one-time only occurrence in their history. Sad to say. And so it is the 24th day of the month. That's the time sequence for chapters 9 and 10. And, of course, you can, you can always note emphasis by how much is said. Notice the first 22 days of the, of the uh, uh, seventh month get 18 verses in chapter 8. What happens on the 24th day is 38 verses of chapter 9 followed by 
another 39 verses of chapter 10. Once again, we can tend to concentrate on what happened the first day. Everybody preaches Nehemiah 8. Nobody preaches Nehemiah 9 and 10. By the way, I usually start my exposition. I, I, in the last 15 years, I've preached Nehemiah 9 more than any other passage of Scripture. And I begin by saying it's one of the most important unknown chapters in all of the Bible. There's only one that is more important. That's Jeremiah 33. Everybody preaches Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 33 is the only Old Testament passage where all covenants of the Old Testament are seen in one chapter. So, gentlemen, somewhere along the line, you've got to preach Jeremiah 33. And somewhere down the line, you've got to preach Nehemiah chapter 9 because these are the two great chapters of the Old Testament nobody ever preaches. So, Nehemiah 9. I got the idea from G. Campbell Morgan has a book, Great Chapters of the Bible. I've, I've never even looked at it to see if he has <laughs> Nehemiah 9 in it. I use that as, as my, you know, G. Campbell Morgan said there are great chapters in the Bible. Nehemiah 9 is one of those great chapters nobody knows anything about. Never heard it preached. And I can tell you, you can, you can probably, again, Google my name. So somewhere, some, like I said, I've, I've preached it so many times uh, in, different, uh, in different places. It's got to be there somewhere. So you're not going to hear the whole exposition because I don't have time. Uh, our whole exposition of this usually takes about an hour. So we're just going to have to hit the high point. Sorry about that, gentlemen. That's, that's seminary. Um, the clock is uh, not always our friend. I title it, the people of God confess their sinful heritage to God. And uh, I do have the original message. Um, if you want to go down, and, and what I've done, all right, let me, go, let me give you the exact page here. Um, because it is in your uh, it is in your notes on uh, great is thy faithfulness, um, and it is uh, page twenty five that I've uh, given to you. So you can just jot that. You can you can look at it. Well, let me just leave it here. Might, might as well use what we have. So. And you can see this. This is this is back to the very first time I preached it. Since then, it's uh, the the again. This is not a good homiletical outline. Um, as I as, as a professor, I give myself a C for this, and you have it. So there you go. It's uh, all right. It is. Uh, it's true the text. Uh, but it's not a good homiletical outline, and I have uh, I have changed uh, the the outline over the years, and I still don't have a preaching outline that I'm really satisfied with on Nehemiah. There, the great one of the great chapters of the Bible was never preached, and I still don't have what I would say is a a good uh, communicative outline, you know, homiletical outline for it. Certainly, this reflects the text. The first three verses are the conviction of Israel. Okay, it goes back to, uh, as we said, what is in uh, verse 9. On the first day of the month, they were already convicted because of their sin as they heard Torah. They've continued to hear Torah. Uh, they have to be joyful on the first day. They have to be joyful during the Feast of Tabernacles. That's a that's requirement. So now outside of that, the 24th day, they come together and they begin in humility with fasting and sackcloth and with dirt upon them. Okay, the echo is back to Ezra in Ezra chapter 9. The second thing, and the descendants, that is the seed of Israel. There's another echo back to Ezra chapter 9. So it's going, to be very, it's going to be very similar. Remember we talked about Ezra 9 being pure confession? There's only one petition in this, in this prayer of Israel on that day. And, uh, and it's a, a pretty uh, 
very interesting uh, uh, petition that, uh, that they bring up. It's in verse 32. Do not let all the hardships seem insignificant to you. Basically, all they're saying is, God, take notice of our situation. That's all they ask. Everything else is pure confession. Take notice of our confession. Take notice of the fact we realize that our present condition is based upon our sinful behavior, the sinful behavior of our forefathers and our sinful behavior as well. <coughs> take, and take note of the consequences that we are now enduring. Very, very much echoing what is in Ezra chapter 9. But now it's not just Ezra. It's all the people led by the Levites. So they uh, separate themselves from all foreigners. I don't think this is saying necessarily that there's in a marriage. I think what they're, all this is saying at this point is they separate themselves, they separate themselves from all pagan influence. They realize a detriment when they start to walk in the ways of the people around them. When they do God's work in man's way. which I believe is, from post-exilic Israel on, the besetting sin of Israel, and becomes many times the besetting sin of the confessing church, doing God's work in man's way. And so they separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquity of their fathers. Now, why would they be conscious of the sins of their fathers. What have they just heard for 21 days? Torah. They, and it's going to be interesting, the, the case in point is going to be what happened in the wilderness and also then what happened after the conquest. Now with the conquest, you've got to have the former prophets. I think what happens is by, by hearing Torah, they can't get enough of Scripture and there was more Scripture than just Torah. And uh, they, they are able, in, in their speech, is basically, their confession begins, begins with Sinai, begins with the wilderness, and goes all the way through to the exile. It goes all the way through not only Torah, but the former prophets as well. And they, they realize it. And it's, it's interesting that they hear Scripture and they know the thrust of Scripture is our fathers failed. Now, here's going to be the irony. We're going to get to the end of Nehemiah. And the generation which confesses this is going to fail themselves. This is going to be key because Nehemiah 9, therefore, gives the books way of reading, hearing Israel's history, not only in the distant past, but also in the recent past. Because what was true, confessed in chapter 9 about the fathers, is going to be true of these who are confessing. So if you want to know the author, if the author, chapter 9 is the author's way of saying, listen to these words and take the same understanding because it's true of my history as well. And I'll, I'll tell you before we look to the text, the viewpoint of Nehemiah 9, the people, is, God, you have been faithful, we have not. And we can be even more precise than that. God, you've been faithful to the Abrahamic covenants. We have failed as loyal covenant partners to the Mosaic covenant. And that, and those two covenants, that truth and those two covenants, undergird what is in 
Ezra and Nehemiah. By the way, notice no Davidic covenant. So where are you going to get the messianic thrust in the, the, the Davidic covenant? Now, I know, yes, Christ is the seed of Abraham. Yes, he is the true Israel. He is the greater Moses. I've read the New Testament. Okay, and, all, and you can say all those because, you, yes, you can make those types because that has New Testament warrant. Remember, I, again, I still say that's, that is the boundary for type. A person, a place, an event that prefigures the personal work of Christ based upon New Testament warrant. And if you're going to start talking types, you've got to have a clear definition of what a type is. And, uh, and every old last whatever doesn't become a type just because it might have analogy to Christ. So I see analogies, but analogies aren't, you know, technically types. So that, that's my distinction. As I said, this is still highly debated among evangelical uh, uh, hermeneutic books even to this day. What makes a type? Uh, is every analogy a type? And my answer is no. Uh, so when I was taking the task, well, there's many types in Ezra and Nehemiah. There's many analogies. Uh, what's your definition of type? Okay. I don't want to be the dead horse anymore. Okay. So... So there, there they are. They are standing, confessing their sins and the iniquities of their fathers while they stood in their place. They read from the book of the law again for three more hours. <laughs> it, it's like, give it, give it to us again before we confess. Now, they're already humbled. They're already ashamed. They're already convicted of their sin. So to a certain extent, the last thing you, you say, why do you want to hear it again? Well, they did. They stood in their place. They read from the book of the law for the fourth of the day. And for, a f for th another fourth, another three hours, they confessed and worshipped Yahweh their God. And so we got the Levites on the platform. And these are Levites now that are the singers. In the verse 4, they cry with a loud voice to Yahweh their God. And they lead the people. They, they lead the people in this prayer of confession, the song of confession. And they are leaders. So, yeah, it is their words, but their words become the words of the congregation. Now, now we're dealing with, this is, this is like the Psalms and the, the book of Psalms. The Psalms are handed over to the choir masters so they can be so they can be put to music and sung so that the singers can lead Israel in themselves praying and singing the psalms. Okay, so this is, this is a psalm that, well, didn't, didn't make the cut into the 150. That is in the biblical text. But it is a psalm being led by the Levites who were the, were the singers in the temple. And uh, so we're ready to hear the words that they lead Israel in singing to Yahweh. But uh, the time has come for a break, and if I get into it, you're going to be 30 more minutes before you have a break. Relevant, relevant to this lecture. Okay. Chapter 8, verse 18 talks about reading from the book of the law of God daily from the first day to the last. Mm -hmm. That's in the context of what happened on the second day. So no, 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 no. Well, no, no. It's in the context of what happened on the Feast of Tabernacles from the 15th to the 21st day. No, no, no. Okay. Verse, verse 16. The, the top of this is the seventh month. The yes. Second day. Right? Yes. So it's verse 13, right? Then on the second day. So that would be Tishri the second, right? Yeah, yeah. The okay. second day. So then seven days later, the, they finished that celebration. No, 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 no. No? No, no. Second day is when they begin yeah. to, with Ezra, re-study and learn Torah. Right. Okay? Uh, 
And there they find about the Feast of Booths, which commences on the 15th day. So they send proclamation that the Feast of Booths is to be, is to be observed strictly according to to what is in Leviticus chapter 23. So the first day of verse 18 is the first day of Sukkot? The first day of, uh, from, oh yes, from the first day to the last day, that's, that's the first the day first of the feast. Yes, okay, so that first day be, of the feast. So, so that's the 15th of Tisha. Yes. Got it. Got it? Okay. All right. Well, so, the, so their solemn assembly then was the 23rd of Tisha, because that was the eighth day. Now it's the 22nd. You go 15 through 21. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 22nd day is, is the culminating celebration. The 24th day is when they gather together for confession. There's only one day uh, in between the, the culmination of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's interesting that solemn assembly on the eighth day is a part of the Feast of Tabernacles, but it's outside of the Feast of Tabernacles. So, uh, that, that was also true when you get to uh, John chapter 7. You know, the last, the last great day of the feast. Okay, that's uh, that, that's that's the eighth day. So that's the twenty second or twenty third. Twenty second. Okay, right. here here's the seven. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Okay. And then outside of that is is a final celebration on the morning of the twenty second. So they recover for one day and then they decide to have this yeah this uh, fast and confession two days later. Yeah, the second day, because you're right, this inclusive reckoning. So, yeah, two days later. Okay. All right. Thank which, you for which, which, which for us is the second day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. But, 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 they're, but, they're, but they're inclusive. You see, they're inclusive. You know, so a part of a day equals a day. Okay. So for them, it's two days between. The end, the, the, the last day after the feast when they have this great solemn assembly, which, again, would be joyful. Then they have, a, for us, a day in between. And then they gather together on the beginning of the 24th day. So again, three hours listening to scripture, three hours confessing their sins and worshiping. And this is how they confess during that time with the song as they're led by the Levites. So it all, it all ties in, when you get to Chronicles, it all ties into the way in which, yeah, in, in which worship took place in the temple. This is how it all happened, along with... You know, you bring offerings too, particularly the burnt offering to show, okay, we realize that we are sinners. And uh, so there's a, there's a communal burnt offering that's uh, uh, usually associated with these solemn assemblies because we have to acknowledge our sin and our complete recognition that God has dealt with our sin and we are completely now dedicated to him as his people. That's the burnt offering. Burnt offering is the culminating offering of all offerings. So, again, we would assume at this point on the 24th day, along with all of this, there is the priest is offering a burnt offering on, uh, on, on the, the part of all Israel. In other words, you, I, I, I'm going to put it this way. You can't confess without an offering in the Old Testament. In, in other words, if you're going to confess your sin, how, how is sin dealt with? Not by your verbal confession. Your sin is dealt with by the offering of the appropriate sacrifice, the proper offering that needs to be brought to the Lord. And gentlemen, our prayer life is no different. When you pray, you invoke the person and work of Jesus Christ. I don't come on my own merits. I don't come boldly into God's presence because I just feel like coming boldly into God's presence. I come based upon the fact that I have a Savior who has taken his blood and pleaded it before the Father. I, I go on the merits of Christ in, in, in praying. So do you. Uh, now, we don't think of it in those terms because we start confessing and we just, we just have those little rote things in, in Jesus' name. Or we come to you based upon Jesus' sacrifice because what we want to get to, Lord, is our confession and, and getting off my chest and, and petitions as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, but just, just that very simple, you know, those simple phrases that we tend to offer at the beginning. We come to you on the merits of Christ. At the end, we, we pray these things in Jesus' name. I mean, basically, that's the offering that undergirds our 
confession, our prayer. Okay, there's, there's, again, the analogies between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Okay? And I, I'm big on that. I'm big on seeing analogies. Just don't call them all types. <laughs> okay. All right, it's, uh, well, it's 9.30 by my watch. We'll go by that, so we'll be back at 9.45. Let's... <laughs> dig into this confession prayer, this uh, greatest chapter of the Old Testament that nobody knows.